On November 7, 1943, the submarine USS Sculpin embarked on her ninth war patrol. This mission was pivotal to the Allies' Pacific strategy, as the U.S. Navy prepared for a large-scale assault on the Gilbert Islands. Sculpin's crucial role to intercept any Japanese naval units threatening the invasion. With a 60-person crew, Sculpin blended into the vastness of the Pacific on a patrol scheduled until December 14th. However, as days passed, the expected communications from Sculpin ceased. On November 29th, attempts to engage Sculpin under Commander Cromwell's leadership met only silence. Further orders on December 1st remained unanswered. Four weeks later, with no word or sign, Sculpin was declared lost, her fate shrouded in mystery. At the war's end, with the emergence of only 21 survivors from a Japanese POW camp, glimpses of Sculpin's daring endeavors and the sacrifices made by her crew began to surface. On May 23, 1943, while on her initial shakedown cruise, USS Sculpin, a Sargo-class submarine, was called out of her training duties to assist in an emergency. That day, Squalus, a fellow Sargo-class sub, had gone down off the Isles of Shoals in a test dive when the main induction valve failed, causing the flooding of the aft torpedo room, both engine rooms, and the crew's quarters. Now stuck at the bottom of the ocean, over 200 feet below the surface, the man aboard Sculpin were the first to spot a red smoke bomb and a buoy from Squalus. Soon, the sailors established communication with the stricken sub, first by phone and then by Morse code. Continuing to stand by, as Minesweeper Falcon lowered the newly developed McCann rescue chamber, over the next 13 hours, the Sculpin submarine rescued 33 survivors from the stricken Squalus. The crew of Squalus was eternally grateful to their fellow sailors, and both submarines went on to have illustrious careers, with the stricken boat being renamed Sailfish. Meanwhile, after completing her training off the U.S. East Coast, Sculpin was transferred to the Pacific Fleet where she earned a distinguished record in the Pacific War. By November 1943, the Sargo-class submarine had undertaken eight successful war patrols, during which the sub-sailors had taken the fight to the enemy, taking down a total of 18 Japanese ships, including one cruiser. But despite the significant battles already fought, the Pacific Theater remained a crucial battleground. One of the most important strategic operations in the area for that fall would be Operation Galvanic, targeting the Gilbert Islands for their pivotal location in the Central Pacific. This operation necessitated substantial naval support, with submarines playing a critical role. To this end, Submarine Division 43, led by USS Sculpin, and including Sargo-class Sea Raven and Balao-class Agapon, was deployed. Their mission was to safeguard the sea lanes approaching the Gilbert Islands and thwart any Japanese naval reinforcements which was essential for the success of the impending invasion of Tarawa, one of the islands in the Gilbert's chain. Commanding the three-boat subdivision was Captain John P. Cromwell, while the captain of the Sculpin herself was Commander Fred Conaway. The group was under direct orders of Vice Admiral Charles A. Lockwood, Commander Submarine Force Pacific Fleet, to act like a German wolf pack, operating in concert and supporting each other in order to send as many Japanese vessels to the bottom of the ocean as possible. While neither Commander Conaway nor Captain Cromwell had been on war patrol in an active combat zone before, both men had already served in submarines before. On November 5, 1943, Sculpin left Pearl Harbor for her ninth war patrol in a lively send-off, complete with loud music and a personal goodbye from Admiral Lockwood. By the 16th, following a refuel, the three submarines took position near Truk, west of the Marshall and Gilbert Islands, ready to protect the sea lanes from any approaching Japanese ships. Task Force leader Commander Cromwell knew the Americans in the area had several advantages over the Japanese. He was well aware that the Allies had already broken many of the German and Japanese naval codes, and thus knew where most of the Japanese fleet was or was heading, and he also had detailed knowledge of the upcoming invasion. Surely nothing could go wrong. But then, late on November 18th, the radar aboard Sculpin detected an Imperial Japanese ship in the vicinity. While Conaway's team determined the vessel was not alone, but part of a large convoy consisting of a freighter, five destroyers, and a cruiser, the commander decided to submerge and steer Sculpin parallel to the Japanese group, getting ahead of it in the dark early morning hours of the 19th, and wait patiently for the perfect time to attack. 
with the plan on paper, the crew went to their battle stations, and Sculpin's hull disappeared into the waves. Suddenly, however, the convoy turned and headed for where the Sculpin was waiting. Worried that they'd been detected, Conaway commanded that the sub dive 200 feet as fast as possible to protect themselves from the depth charges that were sure to follow. But once inside, no depth charges fell upon them, and to their surprise, the Japanese convoy sailed on. After breathing a sigh of relief and believing they were finally in the clear, Cromwell and Conaway talked, and both men agreed it was worth a second try to rise to periscope depth in the hopes of catching the valuable enemy convoy before it moved out of their range. After all, taking them down was their one and only mission. After roughly an hour of being submerged, the commander took the submarine up for a look at around 7.30 a.m. As the submarine steadily made her ascent, Quartermaster Billy Minor Cooper and Lieutenant John Allen, stationed on the lookout, were met with a daunting scene. Through the lenses of their binoculars, their eyes were fixed on a distant but distinct threat. A sleeper, a Japanese destroyer that deliberately separated from its convoy. The strategic ploy, designed to ambush unwary American submarines, had worked, and now the Imperial Japanese Navy Yamagumo was sailing fast toward them. Reacting swiftly, Sculpin dove to 300 feet, with the crew tensely preparing for the anticipated depth charge attack. Confined within their 310-foot-long steel box, the crew inside Sculpin were fully at the mercy of the enemy, unable to shoot back, and the destroyer, knowing this, launched 17 600-pound depth charges in the initial run alone. In 30-second intervals, the massive metal cylinders detonated underwater shaking the vessel and the people inside her like a sledgehammer. As the depth charges continued, Sculpin began to take on water, and the situation worsened as its pumps failed and became inoperative. Fortunately, a drizzle at the surface disrupted the Japanese destroyer's initial assault and provided a brief respite for the beleaguered crew. Still, Commander Conway ordered that the submarine remain submerged for several more hours to ensure their safety. While fate had granted Sculpin a temporary reprieve, the submarine's crew did not rest for a single second, as the men were too busy trying to seal leaks and pumping the excess water out of their submarine. After about nine hours of attack after attack, the heat inside the vessel had reached 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Instruments were broken and battered, and the depth gauge, crucial for safe navigation and maneuvering, was so damaged it was no longer reliable. When Conaway ordered the submarine to rise to periscope depth, hoping the destroyer had gone away due to the weather, the failing submarine rose too fast, with her bow breaking the surface. In the conning tower, Commander Conaway found Yamagumo was now only 5,000 yards away. Commanding another emergency dive, Sculpin descended once again, all as over a dozen depth charges continued to fall near the boat. By then, Sculpin was so damaged she was nearly uncontrollable and unable to measure her depth. She dove 700 feet, well over her maximum amount. Soon, the sub would be crushed under the water pressure. While Conaway and his men managed to stop their descent, they only did so by going through the water at full power, draining the boat out of nearly all her battery, and giving the Japanese sonar above more noise with which to target them. For the final time, a nearly defeated Commander Conaway and Captain Cromwell convened to ponder their options. The former felt they had only one choice, to surface and fight it out as long as possible. Captain Cromwell strongly disagreed with Conaway, as the American Wolf Pack leader believed the Japanese destroyer must be low on depth charges because he'd counted nearly 60 already dropped. And so, with no other option, Commander Cromwell and Captain Conaway agreed to surface for one last time at 1.30 p.m. As she did, Captain Conaway himself and the rest of Sculpin's gun crew ran out onto the deck to man the three-inch deck gun and the 20-millimeter batteries, all while knowing they were no match for the enemy. But they could at least try. While Sculpin managed to fire two rounds at the Japanese destroyer, there was no doubt as to who would win the vastly unequal contest. As Yamagumo opened up with her powerful five-inch guns, the first Japanese shell hit the submarine's conning tower, taking the lives of Conaway and all the men of the gun crew and the watch team. The boat's second-in-command, Lieutenant George Brown, 
now found himself at the top of rank of the stricken boat. Parts of his beloved submarine were now an unrecognizable wreck, and a shadow of the vessel she once was for eight successful patrols. But the sea was now claiming her, and Brown, knowing there was nothing left to do but prime the boat with explosives, abandon it, and sink it, gave the order. And as difficult as that final order was to give, there was one man who had a worse decision to make, Commander Cromwell. Below deck, an uninjured Commander Cromwell knew the time was ticking on what to do. As a senior officer in the Navy, the 42-year-old Cromwell knew a lot about his branch's plans for the Pacific and had vital knowledge about the Navy's success in deciphering Japanese codes. Cromwell knew too much to risk capture. If seized by the Japanese, Cromwell would be a valuable prize, and there was a high likelihood, knowing the Empire's reputation, that the enemy would resort to their infamous and brutal methods of extracting information. Knowing this, Cromwell knew there was only one thing to do. He had to go down with the ship. So, while the last of the uninjured sculpin sailors opened the seacocks and escaped, the brave captain informed those around him of his final decision. Some would soon follow suit, including dive officer Ensign W.M. Fielder, who chose to remain behind to ensure the submarine sank. Some of the severely wounded men, knowing the treatment they would receive at the hands of the Japanese, also chose to stay behind. And so Cromwell and the others, in one selfless act of bravery, went down with the submarine. Above the water, the escaped sailors recalled seeing their beloved submarine one last time as she went down with the water. According to torpedo man Harry F. Tony, quote, the last I saw of her was the radar mast going under. She made a beautiful dive. A total of 42 men abandoned Sculpin, and they immediately realized their fear about the Japanese treatment of prisoners was true when, upon capture, one wounded sailor was thrown back into the ocean. Once brought into captivity, the group was taken to Truk, where they endured ceaseless interrogations. But when the Japanese realized the American lower ranks had nothing to tell them, it was decided they would be shipped to Japan. Eventually, a group of 21 of these men were aboard the Japanese carrier Chuyo for transport to a POW camp. On the night of December 3rd, the convoy, making its way to Japan, encountered a severe typhoon. When conditions worsened, Chuyo's commander ceased evasive maneuvers, believing there was no way any Allied ship would attack under such inclement weather. However, thanks to code-breaking, the Americans were already well aware of the Japanese convoy, and a submarine was already in the area. But in a sad twist of fate, this submarine, with her sights on the American carrying Chuyo, was none other than the USS Sailfish, previously known as Squalus. Four years before, some of the men from Sculpin had rescued Sailfish in New England. Now, unknowingly, they unleashed their power upon Chuyo, leaving only a single American survivor, George Rosick. He was picked up by a Japanese ship, and later joined the remaining survivors in a prison camp. By the time the survivors were released on September 5th, 1945, only 21 men from Sculpin had survived. For the events of November 19th, 1943, Commander Fred Conaway was awarded the Silver Star, while Captain John Cromwell was awarded the Medal of Honor. Cromwell became the most senior submariner ever to be awarded the Medal of Honor in World War II, and one of the three submarine officers who received the medal posthumously. <laughs> <laughs>